Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is DAO 2002 CPD webinar series. Uh, very warm welcome to all of you. Today we have two excellent uh, speakers, uh, Dr. Sajid Mahmood from USA and uh, Dr. Hassan Raza from Ireland. Uh, Sajid is going to talk about uh, obesity and Hasnan's presentation is, uh, is, is next after that from septic arthritis. So, uh, Sajid, over to you. Okay, thank you, Naseem. Uh, hello, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, obesity is a big topic, and uh, I did not know where to start. Then I, I decided, you know, I'll just give you a general overview of the obesity and uh, what it is and what it causes. And I think everyone knows, uh, you know, some of things from the obesity, but I'll talk something more specific. And if you have any question, you can uh, interrupt me and ask those questions, or you can ask those questions later on in the session as well. Now, my heading is obesity is dangerous. And why I choose this topic, I'll explain in, in a little bit. Okay, first of all, uh, obesity is a disease. It's not just a, life, a lifestyle issue. Most people consider it since you know they eat too much or you, they do not do an exercise and that's why they, they, they are gaining weight. It's not true because at the same house, there are five people, so 10 people are living. Some are big and some are lean and they're eating the same food. They are living in the same environment, but some, they, they are bigger than the, the others because some have disease, the similar, someone has diabetes, other don't. Someone has high cholesterol, other don't. That's why those people who are big, who are obese or who are overweight, they are because of the disease process. Now, what is uh, obesity? Obesity is an excess weight that puts uh, your health at risk. Excess weight that causes uh, multiple diseases, dysfunction in the body. Now, the, 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 there is an extensive definition of uh, obesity. Uh, obesity is a chronic, progressive, relaxing disease. And some people say it's a chronic, uh, mild, inflammatory disease. And there is a basically dysfunction in the hypothalamus area because of chronic inflammation. There is chronic inflammation in the intestine. There is chronic inflammation in the muscles. There is chronic inflammation in the brain that leads to this disease called obesity. Now let's talk about a little bit uh, pathophysiology. We all know adipose tissue is loose connective tissue that is composed of adipocytes. And uh, according to all definition, it stores energy, it uh, provides cushions and insulate the body. Now, the new definition is uh, adipose tissue is a dynamic and varied endocrine organ. And now they say the biggest endocrine organ in our body is adipose tissue because fat is everywhere. The pancreas, the adrenals, the pituitary gland is very small organs, but the fate is everywhere. That's, that's why it's the biggest endocrine gland in the body. Now you see this uh, adipocyte or fat tissue, uh, it is, is considered endocrine factory. It produces almost 600 adipokines. 600 adipokines produced by the uh, adipocytes. And uh, if someone has overweight or obesity, these adipokines do not function normally. And because of the dysfunction, there are many, many diseases. Now, I think I put this on this side. Okay, let's see. Next. Now, th th this picture is very important. It shows basic mechanism of obesity. Basically, there are two pathways. If you can see, okay, there are two pathways. One is, is called POMC, P-O-M-C, and there is another one is called uh, NPY-AGRP. 
Okay, POM C is pro opio melanocortin. It's in the hypothalamus arcuate nucleus. I'm not sure how to put the cursor because the other screen is shown up. Okay, this POM C, uh, it regulates our satiety or it decreases our weight. This uh, NPY AGRP, uh, it, it increases our weight. We, we, we get signals from different areas like small intestine, adipose tissue, stomach, and large intestine. Why this is causing this problem? Okay, Th those signals, they go to uh, hypothalamus, POMC neurons, and POMC neurons, you know, they send signals, second order neurons to paraventricular nucleus. And then it regulates our, uh, you know, appetite, decreases our appetite and causes weight loss. The other portion is NPY, NPY and agouti related peptide, uh, neuropeptide Y and agouti related peptide, which causes weight gain. And there, there's a hormone from the intestine, it's called ghrelin, that increases our weight. And there are a bunch of other hormones which decreases our weight. Now, uh, etiologies of obesity, of course, there, there are a bunch of etiologies, and uh, one is genetic, of course. Uh, some people have single gene mutations, some have polygene inheritance, and there are acquired causes. Medical illnesses causes uh, obesity, uh, endocrine diseases can cause obesity, hypothalamic injury or diseases can cause obesity, and there are, of course, environmental developmental uh, factors too. The biggest portion for our people, like the medical profession, is medications. There are many medications can lead to increased weight, which we do not pay attention. And because of those medications, uh, most patients, they keep going, getting the weight. Now, this slide shows how prevalence is overweight and obesity. You see uh, this green area, it's just one state, Colorado, which has less than uh, 20 to 25%, but all over the US, everyone is either overweight or obese. And some state, they have like BMI more than 35%, and majority of other states, they have BMI between 30 to 35%. And this yellow is between 25 to 30%, which is overweight. Either all the America is overweight or obese. More than half population is obese. And the remaining half uh, portion is overweight. And you can see this is the very serious condition. Now this slide shows uh, the general uh, prevail, uh, prevalence of obesity in adults. Uh, you can see uh, here, main, it shows like 35.9% uh, prevalence, but the other slide which I showed is more recent and it shows more uh, uh, obesity. Now, since everyone knows obesity is more prevalent, but there is less than 1% people, they get anti-obesity medication because they do not consider it as a disease. They consider it as a lifestyle uh, change and because if they can change uh, their lifestyle and their obesity will go down, but they are not able to do that. Now, Nassim, somehow these slides run automatically. I do not do anything. But anyway, uh, obesity uh, poses two kinds of diseases. One is called a uh, sick fat disease. There is fat, which is sick, which is dysfunctional. Uh, there is a fate which is dysfunctional and it produces a bunch of hormones which cause dysfunction in other organs or other areas. And there's another thing is called fate mass disease. Uh, the fate produces pressure on the organs, on the nerves, on the tissues, and those tissues get, you know, diseases because of uh, that. Now, uh, obesity and overweight can produce up to 236 diseases. Uh, I say this thing to all my patients, obesity is the mother of all diseases because it produces children, 
the children are the diseases. There are 236 diseases. And you know, you name from head to toe, every organ is involved with the obesity. Now, this is the most interesting slide. Obesity and overweight uh, also causes multiple cancers. It causes cancers or cancers are associated with the obesity. One of the risk factor of getting cancer is obesity. And you, say, you see in this slide, uh, there are many cancers, thyroid cancer, liver cancer, gallbladder cancer, pancreas cancer, endometrial cancer, esophageal cancer, and there are others associated with uh, this overweight and obesity. Some say they are like 12 or 13 cancers linked with the, uh, overweight and obesity. And some studies say up to 17 cancers out of 21 cancers linked with overweight and obesity. Now, if we analyze these cancer, if we analyze these cancers, 30% uh, of all cancer are caused by tobacco smoking. And 20% of all cancer are caused by obesity. And there are 5% cancer caused by inactivity. And there are 5% of all cancer caused by abnormal diet. Diet, inactivity, and overweight or obesity, it produces 30% of all cancers. Meaning being overweight or obese is as bad as someone is smoking. Like 30% of all cancer caused by this obesity. Okay, now th there's a recent study in March. Uh, it shows obesity related cancer on the rise in young adults. Like there are six cancers out of 12 obesity related cancer, they are increased uh, between 25 to 49 years of age. And those six cancers are colorectal cancer, endometrial cancer, multiple myeloma, gallbladder, kidney, and pancreatic cancers. And uh, th the same study shows that there is a steeper rise in successive generations. Like second generation and third generation, they get more cancer at younger age. And uh, the same study shows that uh, one in 17 cancers is caused by overweight and obesity. Okay, now regarding classification of uh, obesity, of course, uh, uh, everyone knows there is a BMI between 18.5 to 24.9, which is normal weight. And uh, between 25 to 29.9 is overweight. And obesity is considered BMI above 30. And then there are different classes. Class one is between 30 to 35, uh, class two between 35 to uh, 40, and class three is 40 or above. And now this classification is for, uh, you know, West, for uh, Pakistan, India, Asia, the classification uh, overweight is BMI 23, and BMI 25 is called obesity. Like for us, our BMI is 25 and we are considered obese. Now for children, uh, we usually use a percentile. Uh, between five to 84 percentile is normal. Above uh, 85 to 95 percentile is called overweight. And uh, above 95 percentile is called obesity. And there, of course, there are different classification for them as well. And for children, we use these uh, growth charts. They are like between five to uh, 95 percentile. And then there are some charts which shows above 95 percentile too. Now, uh, the person body fat. Obesity is considered in women if fat is more than or equal to 32 percent, and men is more than or equal to 25 percent. Now, th this is more important. Uh, 
having more fat in the body is not dangerous, but having more fat in the abdominal area or abdominal obesity is more dangerous. Uh, for men, if they are more than 40 inches, in women, if they are more than 35 inches, is considered abdominal obesity. But again, for Asians, for Pakistani and Indian, this, this is different. It's like less uh, in Asian, it's like around 32 uh, inches and around uh, 30 inches called uh, abdominal obesity. There are different staging system too. Uh, which I rarely use in, in my practice too, uh, because uh, it, it's sort of uh, time consuming, but it's there. Now, what should be the management? Uh, the management improves uh, patient health, uh, quality of life, and body weight and body composition. Now, th th these are the uh, you know, approaches for weight loss. Uh, one is self-directed lifestyle intervention done by the patient, and there is provider-directed lifestyle therapy, and there is uh, medications, and then there are weight loss devices, then weight loss surgery, and then uh, after surgery, combination of therapy, medication, and other stuff. Now, regarding diet, uh, there are different versions about the diet plan. There's low calorie diets between 1,200 to 1,800 calories per day. There is a low carbohydrate diet and there is low fat diet. Low carbohydrate is between 50 to 150 gram per day and very low is less than 50 gram per day. Low fat is less than 30 and very low fat is less than 10%. Now, very low calorie diet, less than 800, is recommended for short duration and physician should monitor it. And those are like a meal replacement and commercial shakes. Now, these are the some studies uh, published in uh, New England Journal of Medicine in 2008. It shows uh, effect of different diets on weight loss. You see initially uh, each diet causes weight loss, but there is more weight loss with low carbohydrate diet. And then as the time goes by at 24 month, you see uh, this uh, low fat diet or low carbohydrate and Mediterranean diet, they're almost equal weight loss. And low fat diet is uh, on, on the like the less weight loss. Ajit, now, you have two more minutes. Okay, I'm almost done. Okay, uh, this slide shows effect on uh, different diets on the lipids. And you can see from this slide, uh, all the cholesterol gets better with the almost every kind of diet, more with low carbohydrate diet. And then of course, we recommend that, you know, we should do more activity, uh, at least 150 minutes of exercise uh, per week or 75 minutes of uh, vigorous activity per week. And then uh, th these are, we should learn from our colleague, which uh, post all the pictures on the Facebook that he's walking and he's hiking. And uh, we should also do the same thing too. Now, the, the, these are the medication for weight loss. We normally prescribe, it's called Fintramine. And then the next is called Fin-Dimetrazine. And the next is Diethylpropion. Tosemia, Belwig, Contrave, and uh, of course, this is Sexanda, which is uh, injectable. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Sajid. Excellent presentation. Uh, okay, now if you uh, click on stop share, and we can have uh, Snan. With his presentation. Hassan, are you ready? <clears throat> Hassan, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. So, are you hearing me? Yeah, yeah. we can hear you. Just click on screen share. 
yeah so can you see my uh, uh, slide no not yet no no why is that why is not sharing no just click on yeah yeah now it's coming that's it now it's coming yeah yeah we can see it okay now very good. okay assalam alaikum uh, good morning good evening good afternoon uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, present um, very uh, important topic in orthopedics it is uh, it is one of the emergencies in orthopedics septic arthritis i will be going to present uh, uh, discuss definition epidemiology risk factors pathophysiology clinical presentation of the condition imaging modalities which are needed the board to work up diagnosis differential diagnosis management complications and if i get time i made such few uh, words for the prosthetic joint infection which is a separate topic but if we i have a time so septic arthritis is a condition uh, characterized by infection of the synovium and the capsule and the joint space and the infection causes an intense inflammatory response and reaction which re releases degenerative enzymes proliferating enzymes from the bacteria as well as the inflammatory cells and they lead to destruction of the articular cartilage and synovium so it is most the most commonly affected joints are, are is the knee which is around 50% and then the the another common is hip which is around 17 to 20% followed by shoulder elbow ankle and sternoclavicular joint there's another joints which can also be involved which is wrist so, uh, small hands uh, joints of the hand small joints of the feet and uh, sacroiliac joint the risk factors of this condition is uh, older age group and the patients who have medical conditions like uh, diabetes or rheumatoid arthritis in rheumatoid arthritis the immunity is low due to the disease itself as well as the patients are on the immunosuppressive medicines and then if someone has underlying cld hiv history of crystal arthropathy endocarditis or recent bacteremia iv drug users and if any sur recent surgical procedure is done on a joint that can lead to increased risk of the condition epidemiology is slightly different in the pediatric age group so hip joint and the knee joint are equally affected and 50% of the cases in the kids they are younger than 2 years of age and the risk factors for the neonatal septic arthritis is is prematurity relatively immunocompromised kids and the kids who are born with a c section patients treated in the nicu and in any neonate who has a invasive procedure done even a benign like venous catheterization that can lead to or the heel puncture can lead, lead to transient bacteremia and in in result septic arthritis this is a very important slide and uh, this shows the etiological uh, factors which can lead to the condition there are three main uh etiologies either bacteremia like if someone has uti like old age group and they or the uh, respiratory tract infection due to bacteremia the infective organism can seed into the synovium and start the uh, the process of uh, septic arthritis and another uh, etiological factor is direct inoculation it could be post trauma if someone has a fall or and there is a penetrating injury to the uh, particular joint that can lead to introduction of the organism into the joint or if someone has any surgical procedure done or even a benign procedure of injection in the joint in in a office like in a rheumatological by the physician or by the gp or even the orthopedic uh, uh, surgeons they can have uh, introduced the organism in the joint so that can lead to septic arthritis so even the joint injection is not a totally benign procedure then contiguous is spread from the adjacent bone if someone has osteomyelitis uh, put, uh, in kids uh, the the joints are uh, 
in, in the joints, the capsule is bridging the, one of some of the portion of the metaphysis. So they, like uh, in, in, the, in the slide, you can see the osteophytes and the joint here, they, they can see it from the, uh, from the bone into the joint. And vice versa, if someone has osteo, uh, septic arthritis, that can lead to osteomyelitis. And osteomyelitis can lead to septic arthritis. Cellular biology, in, in, I have already uh, touched that like in, 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 uh, the organisms can secrete different type of proteolytic enzymes which dissolute the collagen in the articular cartilage. And they, they destroy the articular cartilage. Once they are destroyed, the, they don't regenerate. So, and if, depending on the virulence of the organism, if it is highly virulent, they can destroy the cartilage even within eight hours. So in kids, particularly, it is mandatory to, to have a prompt response if one is suspecting uh, septic arthritis. Secondly, in, in the kids, they are still in the growing uh, phase. The bones are still in the growing phase. The, 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 the growth uh, plates, they are not fused yet. So due to increased effusion in the joint, and they need to increase pressure, which compromises the vascularity of the bone which is in the joint. And this is more related to the hip joint in the femoral head. When there is increased pressure in the joint, the, the vascularity compromise and lead to avascular necrosis. Again, that is a very uh, difficult and um, uh, uh, drastic uh, outcome. Streptococcus organism is the most common in any age group. And, and it accounts more than 50% of the cases. Uh, second is, and then there's um, gonococcal arthritis. They are usually present with 60% of the cases with dermatitis as well. Another gram-positive cocci are streptococcus pyogenes and uh, group B streptococci. Group B, they are common in infants, elderly, and the diabetic patients. Gram-negative bacilli, they are also, uh, they are, if someone has a gram-negative infection in the joint, the prognosis is very poor because they are highly virulent and they destroy the articular cartilage very rapidly. And the pathogens could be E. coli, Proteus, Klebsiella, Enterobacters, and the risk factors, again, the immunocompromised patients, neonate, IV drug users, and elder, elderly uh, age group patients. Uh, Nassim might be interested in, in this picture. <laughs> anyway, so uh, there are different organisms which are particular with different uh, uh, conditions. Propylobacterium is, is common in shoulder surgeries, and Salmonella in sickle cell disease, Pasteurella multocida, this is common in uh, dog or cat bite. They are anaerobes, so if someone has a condition for septic arthritis post uh, bite from the animal, they should be covered with the anaerobes as well. And Bartonella hansley is common in HIV, Pseudomonas aeruginosa in drug, IV drug abusers, Echinella corridans. They, uh, they are present in the patients with the uh, human bite. Usually in a, a human bite, it is basically a fight bite. If someone punch on the face, the, there, is a, uh, there is an injury to the knuckles or the, or the joints of the hand, the teeth of the opponent. Though you have punched, but you will get the injury. And mostly we, we see these patients, they are delayed presentation because they think it is a benign thing and they just, uh, clean the wound at home. After two or three days, they come with the massive swelling and significant pain. So, uh, so th this is a condition which we see in the in the uh, emergency departments. Fungal infections they are common in immunocompromised hosts. This is a slide which I have taken from one of the book uh, or com our very important book. But it also it shows like organisms which are. Uh, common in certain age group. But if you see in this slide, Staphylococcus aureus is common in all three groups. But in, in, in uh, children from one to 16 years, Kingila, Kingi, and Staphylococcus 
streptococcus pyogenes is common in adult more than 16 you can see uh, gram negative organisms as well in clinical presentation there could be history of local trauma a penetrating trauma with a thorn with uh, some metal objects with the glass or there is a recent infection if some they might have uh, upper respiratory tract infection a few days back and then they now presented with the with the inflamed uh, heart swollen joint if if the patient is already on antibiotics for some other infection so the symptoms of the septic arthritis is mask so it is uh, very uh, difficult to diagnose the diagnostic dilemma then symptoms they they can present acutely with the with the pain swelling of the joint and they are more acute than the osteomyelitis often associated with the fever and toxic look and appearance they they if it is in the lower limb they will be limping in the gait and they refuse to put weight on that leg you can see swelling in, in if you can see this slide you know on the one side you can see there is a, a appreciable swelling as compared to the other side there could be uh, in in the kids one can appreciate the abnormal posture of the of the limb the child will try to put the put the limb which is a, a more comfortable position and that is the position in which the the joint volume is maximum so in the kids in the hip area they usually keep the hip flex external, uh, externally rotated abducted and then there's a term which is called pseudo paralysis pseudo paralysis this is the child is not moving the limb because initially someone say okay could be some neurological problem but mostly it is due to the the pain that he, the patient is not the moving the limb and and then palpation there will be warmth tenderness we have to check the effusion in the knee it is easy to check the effusion but if the joints which are deep like hip joint clinically you can't appreciate effusion then there's another modalities to check the effusion and in the ankle joint if it is a massive swelling you can appreciate but if it is just a mild swelling you cannot appreciate then you have to go for a ultrasound or mri scan x-rays the x-rays has uh, ap and lateral of the joint you have to get uh, two views ap and lateral but in the early stages the x-rays may, may be normal and uh, sorry for that uh, would you give me a, just one minute like you know just a few seconds Sorry, I'm really sorry for that. So, uh, so X-rays initially could be normal, but if the effusion is there, particularly in the hip joint, you can see there's a widening on the left side. And there's a effusion in the elbow joint and the knee joint. Ultrasound is a good modality, but again, like it is uh, operator dependent, and every institution sometimes they don't have the ultrasound to perform. MRI, it is uh, highly sensitive to detect the effusion. If you can see in this picture, it just beneath the patella you can see the white uh, signal. But it it is also helpful in detecting the osteomyelitis. You can see in the distal femur here. Lab workup, white cell count could be more than 10. 
ESR could be more than 30. ESR is again, like, you know, we all know that from the basics that it take time to increase. And again, it take time to decrease. And CRP more than 10, it, it raises the suspicion of uh, septic arthritis. This is a very uh, important slide. Uh, it shows the Cocker's criteria. It is applicable in the pediatric age group. It is helpful to distinguish from uh, transient synovitis. So, uh, if you can see in the in the picture here, there are four things we see in the in this criteria. Number one is the child is non weight bearing. Limping is not the uh, positive criteria. But if due to the pain, the child is not bearing weight at all, then it is positive. And then ESR more than 40, fever, temperature more than 38.5, and white cell count 12,000. Uh, if one of the criteria is positive, the 3% likelihood of septic arthritis. It's still, it is important because we cannot leave 3%. If someone has even one criteria is positive, we should. Uh, or for the septic arthritis. And if none of the above predictors are present, probability of having septic arthritis is less than 0.2%. And CRP, which is not part of this criteria, but if it is positive with the uh, refusal to bear weight, the uh, probability of septic arthritis is 74%. So in the in the diagnosis, the gold standard for the diagnosis is uh, taking the fluid, jo joint fluid aspirate. It is easy to get from the knee, but if another joints, most of the time you need an assistance from uh, radiology. Either you can perform it in the theater under image intensifier or through ultrasound guidance. Should be analyzed for cell count with differentials. We have to check for the gram strain, culture, glucose levels, crystal analysis. Septic arthritis occurs concurrently with gout or pseudo gout in less than 5% of the cases. Characteristic findings you can see the fluid will be cloudy and purulent, but uh, it is, if it is just a cloudy and purulent, it is not a diagnostic because in crystal arthropathy, it could be the same. So cell count with white cell count more than 50,000 is considered diagnostic for septic arthritis. Gram strains only identifies infective organism one third of the time. And glucose less than 60% of serum levels. Blood cultures should be performed if the patient is uh, febrile as they are often positive even when local cultures are negative. And lumbar puncture should be performed when uh, when you are suspecting some element of meningeal irritation as well. Again, this is a common slide because we, we have to see whether it is a septic or something else going on. In, in these two pictures, you can see there is inflamed skin uh, and the soft tissue are, are on the elbow. So this is a auricranial bursitis. And another is there is a, a pre bursitis, which is one of the differential diagnoses. Then the crystal arthropathy, cellulitis, transient synovitis, rective synovitis, osteomyelitis, myositis, if there is a surrounding muscles that are inflamed or infected, the patient can present with a pain and swelling around the joint. And then uh, iliosos abscess. I'll you a minute. Okay. Treatment, considered, considered an orthopedic and surgical emergency, and the treatment is operative derangement, irrigation, drainage of the joint, and, and you have to decide whether you're going open or arthroscopic. Standard of care for the septic hip, it, if possible, in septic arthritis, it is better to err on the side of surgical drainage. If you're suspecting and if the, your clinical uh, uh, scenario is equivocal, whether it is septic or not, you have to go for the, you consider the septic and perform the procedure to, uh, to clean the uh, joint. And then there's the antibiotics, Ideally, you should have a specimen before starting antibiotics, but in certain cases when the, when the patient is sick enough that you can't wait for the patient to be taken to theater, then you can, uh, you can start antibiotics, particularly in the kids 
in which you don't uh, do the aspiration in the ED, you do the aspiration in the theater. So if the patient is sick enough, you can start antibiotics after taking the blood cultures. And the antibiotics is usually one to three uh, weeks IV, but it depends on the outcome and the progress, and you can uh, switch to oral. Total treatment is uh, four weeks of antibiotics. And once the CRP is normal, you can stop it. Sometime you need to take the patient to theater few times, like two or three times for rewash out, depend on the progress of the, of the treatment. And the complications of this can, because in the kids, it can cause uh, uh, growth arrest. They can lead to limb line discrepancies, osteonecrosis of the hip, deformities. And uh, I won't go for prosthetic joint infection because it's a separate topic. And uh, thank you very much. I, I, I thought if I had a time, I will touch this one, but I think this is a complete separate. So septic arthritis in the native joint, it is uh, one of the emergencies and we have to deal it promptly. Otherwise the outcome will be uh, drastic. And I'm thank you very much, questions. Hasnan. No problem. No problem. Welcome. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Excellent presentation and I'm sure uh, audience uh, will have uh, lots of questions. So uh, we've got about 15, 16 minutes. So I'm going to open the floor to uh, our participants. So if they have any questions, I'm going to unmute all of you. <laughs> questions? Okay, I think whilst the people are waiting, uh, thinking about questions, Sajid, I've got uh, two very quick questions. Mm. One is, why is it that uh, Colorado has the least uh, kind of obesity uh, uh, population percentage? And the second question is, when would you give medicines to obesity? Is it when somebody has active tried physical exercise and healthy lifestyle and they have failed? Is that when you recommend treatment? Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for the question. Now, as you see, uh, almost every state has more obesity than the uh, Colorado exact mechanism. I do not know. Maybe it's the food portion or the quality of food in Colorado is different than the other states. But uh, sooner or later, they will get the same rate there too. Because as the obesity okay. is growing everywhere, it will be everywhere. In the previous map, when I saw it, uh, I think it was uh, in 2016 or so, uh, there were more states with the green color. And now there's only one state with the green color. Maybe in the future, that green color will, uh, will go away. Now regarding the other question, we usually see uh, uh, if the BMI is more than 30 and uh, uh, if patient fails lifestyle modification in three months, then uh, medications are recommended. Or if BMI is more than 27, uh, plus medical conditions like diabetes or other diseases, then medications are recommended. Uh, Sajid, I've got a question for you. Yes. You, know, you, you said abdominal obesity is dangerous and you gave us some measurements like uh, waist for men is like 40 inches or waist for men is 35 inches. Is that the waist size, the diameter, or what, what are you talking about? Uh, is, is the maximum girth of, uh, you know, the, the biggest part of the abdomen. Okay. So what do we not, do? Not like uh, so some people put their belt below the the maximum part at the lo lowest area. That's not called uh, abdominal obesity. It's the biggest portion of the abdomen. Okay, so mm -hmm. uh, and you said for for Asian, Indian, and Pakistanis, it's supposed to be like what 32, 34 waist size. Yes, it, it's le less than uh, what than this is. This is for the you know like uh, other people like <laughs> the other countries. But for us, it's, it's less. It's like around 30, 32. So anybody who's above 32 inches of waist mm -hmm. in Pakistan is obese? Uh, you can say that, yes. I, it depends too. Like not, 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 not Last every... time I had 32 inch waist was when I was a schoolman. It also depends upon your anatomy, isn't it? No, no seriously. No, that's true. That's what I'm telling you. Tall, There's another thing too. Not every person who has obesity or more BMI or more fat in the body is considered obese or disease or sick person. Because if, uh, 
there is a term is called sick fat disease if fat produces a dysfunction in the body if that mm. person has high blood pressure if that person has a uh, diabetes if that person has high cholesterol then yes that's considered obesity if that person does not have so any you can disease, have, so so what you're saying is according to your uh, uh, description if you have more than 14 inches of waist but you got no diabetes no high blood pressure no hypercholesterol so you're not obese and uh, no that's not i say i say for the less inches in the abdomen for the asians any yep. person who who is more than 40 inches uh, if that person does not have disease right now they are mm-hmm. cancerous they are highly cancerous that person will get it okay <laughs> So so Sajid my question is uh, you telling us okay that all the things that you know, high blood pressure and the cholesterol and everything i think that you going towards the metabolic syndrome rather than obesity by itself okay so let's suppose i mean to me correct me if i'm totally wrong i mean for american or for the western uh, where is Aston Court Port- hotel they have Aston right Court, the middle of, you know 40 inch okay, is for the western you. people or american but i think for the asian as far as i know is like a 35 inch plus is the obesity either they have uh, hypertension or high cholesterol and everything or yes or no it doesn't matter that's going towards the metabolic syndrome not right. the obesity if you if let's suppose if somebody had a 35 plus inch and he is a indian pakistani bangladeshi or nepali or um, chinese automatically they are automatically cause an obese regardless whatever it is correct me if i'm wrong what yes. 36 inches of waist or what 30 35 inches of 30, waist 35 waist what time about 35 plus is obese period tum mashhoor mein aur tu to obese ho gaya i agree <laughs> i'm telling you you cannot no, you no, cannot there is another thing too this, this as, is, as, as i said branding i don't agree with this Yeah, no, they, they, that's 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 a recommendation. That's what they're using the recommendation here above 35 inches for any Asian because we have a small stature overall as compared to the Western people. So that's why we cannot go the criteria with the Western people criteria goes. Yes. The, 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 the other thing with, which I said, if your BMI is more than 23 and you're yep, Asian, exactly. you're considered overweight. Exactly. Exactly. You're 25. Sorry, exactly. You're Asian. You are obese. Yeah, what do you mean? We're Asian, we're obese. What is this? This is wrong. I know it's But wrong. But that's what the criteria <laughs> is. That's what the criteria <laughs> is. If it's a right or wrong, we cannot deny that one. I mean, we're Asian, we're obese. Oh my yes, God! I'm <laughs> telling you. No, that's what the reason. Okay, any How questions many... <laughs> for us, Osman? Any questions for Osman? Osman, what uh, about chronic joint pain, man? I think I, I've raised this issue question before as well. Uh, what if you got like chronic knee pain that's been ongoing for more than like six months? Right? I know you. Sorry, it is a native joint or a post surgery? No, 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 no surgery, no nothing. Yeah. Just randomly the pain started. MRI is clear, everything is fine, but you still can't get get a beat on it. So, what do you think might be the reason for it? Uh, uh, how old is the patient? Like, what's the age? Forty-two. Okay, so if there is no history of trauma, okay, mm-hmm. and if the MRI is normal, mm-hmm. and uh, despite all uh, efforts and measures, if the pain is not settling, mm-hmm. then you have to see whether the pain is coming from the joint itself or somewhere else. Number one, okay. So how how would you ascertain that it's coming from somewhere? What what else could be the possibilities that it's coming from some muscle or somewhere? Yeah, like you know, uh, this patient need to be assessed by the musculoskeletal physiotherapist. Mm-hmm. They can check is there any muscles uh, uh, pain or not. Sometimes the, the muscles surrounding the uh, joint, particularly the insertions of the hamstrings in the back, mm-hmm. uh, they 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 could have some uh, tendinopathy which in which the X uh, MRI is normal. So so we have. clinically assess from what is the, if you say the pain is there's no aware pain the pain is coming from the joint itself mm-hmm. then the next step will be to do the scope sometimes right. the mri is uh, are you mean arthroscopy arthroscopy yes yeah sometimes the mri is are normal but still they have some pathology in the knee which we can see on the scope okay okay Mm. Uh, so yeah so the next step is like you know you have to assess by the musculoskeletal physiotherapist to to find is is the pain through the joint itself or somewhere else 
If okay. it's missing the joint itself, then we have to go for next round. Okay. Hasanan, I have a question for you, if you yeah. have. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, um, in knee joint, as you said, it's very easy to uh, palpate and see how the swelling, how you can palpate or find out what's the swelling in the hip joint. That's why I, I spoke like, you know, it's very mm -hmm. difficult. You can't assess. So, any maneuver or anything you can do to find out? No. No, you, no, you have to see whether the pain is coming from the joint itself or not. Again, you have to okay. see the movements. Okay. You have to check the flexion and internal and external rotation of the hip. Okay. If the internal and external rotation is painful, then uh -huh. it means the pain is coming from the hip joint. Then you have to see the causes. Is it the okay. arthritis? It okay. is uh, sometimes there's a labral tear in the young age group. Then okay. sometimes there's a femoral acetabular impingement. Then you have to get x rays or MRI scan. Gotcha. So you can't say effusion on the clinical assessment. So there's no one investigation. It is, it's a par paradigm of investigations, multiples. So you have to go for the MRI scan for the hip. X-ray first, basically. X-ray yeah. is the basic. X-ray, MRI, uh, musculoskeletal, uh, and the clinical examination, basically all, all of them. Yes. Okay. Sajid, I wanted to ask one question. You mentioned that obesity is a neural disease. And I, uh, th this is very interesting because, mm -hmm. um, I mean, is it, so if our behaviors are okay, and if we, f you mean it's a lifestyle disease, if we fix our behaviors, then nobody should be obese in the world. I mean, it, this, is this, is, this is impossible, have, isn't it? So, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I just, I was just very intrigued by this. Uh, because exactly. it was highlighted Obesity is a neurobehavioral disease, and I was very, very intrigued. Sajid, any comments on that? <laughs> Sorry, some yeah, have I'm just disease, unmuted. And some, some have disease, uh, they're living in the same environment, they're eating the same kind of food, but you know, some are bigger than the others. The, the people who have overweight or obesity is a disease process. This, I have seen a person who was eating three plates than the person who was eating one plate, but their person was still skinny because that does not have a disease. The, the hormones released from the fat do not cause dysfunction in the body yet. But if those hormones or the adipokines, if they cause dysfunction in the body, then of course, yes. Even the, uh, the thin person or lean person can have, you know, uh, like uh, adverse effect of their, those adipokines. It, so yes. what, are, what, what are you saying? So if we don't have those adipokines, that means we have a, a failing in our system? Yes. That, that's uh, what we're getting back? Yes. Yeah, there are many hormones. There are like 600 hormones released from the fat. And those hormones, they do not function normally in the body. And mm -hmm. those healthy people in the same house with eating biryani two plates every day, but they're still skinny, their hormones are still functioning normally. But there's this thing in Pakistan, they say, oh, you have a tendency to gain weight. Is that what you're talking about? No. Uh, yes, Th their tendency, meaning they, their system has failed. Now, those people who are obese, uh, their brain, their hypothalamus has, uh, has problem, it's dysfunction. The brain thinks that patient is starving to death. And then okay. that's why patient has to eat more and more. And then brain thinks patient is st starving to death and should conserve energy. That's why they don't move because they move is difficult and they, the disease wants to progress. That's why they, they are not doing activity and they're eating more because of the disease process, not their fault. There's, there's a word for it. No, so sorry, my question, this is called, it's called my question was about the, the behavior. So, you, so behavior is something that you have some control over. So things like behavior therapies and so on yes. so this is something that we we can modify is that something that we can tackle yes, and, yes we and can then, modify and, right yeah if, if you if you eat full stomach and if the sweetest dish or the dish which you like the most is there of course you will go and eat and th this if you eat like more food and more uh, you know your hedonic system in the brain it, it, it also plays a role in the obesity too because all those restaurants which run because we like them, they uh, those are the sort of you know the culprit of you know increasing the obesity. You saw the map; it was less uh, obesity in some states, but now there is more obesity because everyone likes those things. Yeah, probably in Colorado there are less Pakistani restaurants. Huh? 
Sajid, uh, Sajid and Hasnay. They have uh, legal marijuana in Colorado. That's maybe the one. There you go. There you go. There you go. Sajid and Hasnay. Thank you. Yeah, Sajid and Hasnay. Thank you very much for the excellent presentation. Sajid, I've got a question for you and one for Hasnay. Sajid, for you actually, um, like in the UK, we've got nice guidelines where patients could be referred by their community primary care uh, physicians to. Uh, second care surgeons uh, for gastric banding or by surgery, bypass surgery. In the America and the US, have you got anything like that? Have you got criteria that the patients need to fulfill? And for Hasnain, because I've actually just reached the event, I've got to go now. And for Hasnain, there's always this blurry line between um, the septic arthritis. Is it the rheumatologist's job or is it the orthopedic surgeon's job? And many a times my juniors actually get shouted out by the rheumatologist or by the surgeons. This is not our, uh, this is not our problem. It should be rheumatology and vice versa. Thank you. Okay, now uh, for, for the referral, yes, we do have the guidelines too. And if someone has BMI more than 40, then you should refer to the bariatric surgeon. Or if someone has BMI more than 35 with disease process, like uh, sleep apnea or diabetes, then you should refer for the surgery as well. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Hasan? Okay. Yeah, so septic arthritis, usually most of the time it is in orthopedics. Mm -hmm. Because Thank they you. they do the aspiration. If it is a uh, they are suspecting infection, then they will take the patient to theater for the washout. Okay, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but like you know, after the arthrosynthesis and they found that it is uh, they are not convinced this is septic. Something else going on. Like you know, they did the crystals analysis and there is a, a gouty crystals or the pseudo gout is present. Then we say okay, refer this patient to the rheumatology. This is not an orthopedic patient. Okay. Uh, yeah, I know this is a dilemma, particularly in the ED, when from the ED, uh, uh, rheumatologists, they usually don't take the patient from the emergency department. So usually, yes, we orthopedics take these patients. Well done, you. We, we don't have such good orthopedic surgeons. Thank you. Okay. Okay. No problem. I think, is that it, Naseem? Okay, thank you very much. I think it time's up. Um, excellent presentations once again. Thank you, Sajid. Thank you, Hasnan. No problem. And uh, for next month, uh, uh, we have obviously our Dugane event in the UK on the 2nd of uh, November. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are thinking about either the following weekend or the weekend after that, but Mansoor will uh, uh, fill you in with the latest updates. I think yeah, Amir said you. he could do yeah, one thank of the you. weekends. Yeah. And thank you, Naseem. So it's going to be actually not the second, the first uh, Sunday in November. It's going to be either the second weekend or the third weekend. But I'll let you know. And we've got some excellent speakers. We've got Momin Kazi from Pakistan, and we have got Amir Zedi, a neurologist from Leeds. Yeah, cool. Okay. Very okay. Good. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you very Bye. much, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you, guys. Okay. Thank, thank you, guys. Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz.